Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Deuteronomy. It's chapter 28, and I'm reading verses 1 to 14. Thank you, Campbell. <laughs> Blessings for obedience. If you fully obey the Lord, your God, and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in and you'll be blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. The Lord will establish you as, as his holy people as he promised you on oath if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him. Then all the peoples on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock and the crops of your ground in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty to send to send rain on your land in the season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you will pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today, to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. Ah, oh dear. I'm reading the uh, New Testament reads the book of Mark, chapter 10, uh, verses 17 to 31, and it's called The Rich and the Kingdom of God. Okay. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honour your mother and father. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go. Go. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad, because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We are left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or, feel, or fields for me in the gospel will, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, I was um, uh, uh, quite appreciative of the, the pause between the Old and the, the New Testament readings. Uh, I think it uh, dramatically and adequately catches the intertestamental period. So well done, guys. Uh, uh, thanks once again for having me. 
Uh, we are going to come to uh, this uh, part of the Word of God from Mark's Gospel, chapter 17. So, uh, because it's the Word of God, how about I lead us briefly in prayer as we get uh, uh, stuck into it together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you speak to us in your Word, only ever always for our good. We pray, Father, that right now uh, you would uh, help us to lay aside any hindrances or distractions that will get in the way of us trembling and rejoicing at your word, and that on account of uh, uh, listening to it and meditating upon it, we would be moulded more into the likeness of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, you heard from the interview that I gave uh, before, uh, I got uh, saved... Oh. <laughs> I got saved, um, uh, humanly speaking, through uh, my uncle and him presenting me with the gospel. And something fascinating about the way in which that took place was that it gave me a very, very helpful appreciation of what Jesus calls counting the cost of discipleship. I don't think we've got uh, a problem counting the benefit of discipleship. Benefit's really important. Uh, knowing God, living the way you're supposed to, uh, uh, being a member of the kingdom of heaven and entering into eternity. But counting the cost is really important. And here's how it happened. Uh, I'd had a chance meeting with my uncle. I went to see him and we got talking and after a while he said, let me tell you what I believe and why. And he presented the gospel to me in a, a really helpful, uh, quick sort of framework called Two Ways to Live. Some of you may have heard of it before. And uh, he comes to the end and says, Ben, you need to make a choice. You can continue to live your own life, your own way, not under God. Sadly, that is the choice most people will make. And it does result in a rejection from God both now and into eternity. The alternative is to turn to God, which is what repentance means. And uh, uh, put yourself under the lordship of Jesus Christ, who has died to pay for your sin, who has risen to show that he is uh, the Lord and the giver of life. And uh, you live a new life in him and also enjoy eternity with him. And I knew that that first box is where I was. I was living my own life my own way. And I knew that I wanted to change. I wanted to repent. I recounted in my head all the things he said and went, yep, yeah, I can't believe I'm saying this, but, but you're right. I want to turn and put my trust in Jesus. To which my uncle, of course, said, no. No. Folded up the piece of paper, with the Bible references, gave it to me and he said, think about it, sleep on it, digest it. And at this point, even then, in my mind, I went through the, I just replayed the logic, wait a minute, yes, there is a God, okay, made everything, made us, yes, all of us have rebelled against him, we said, no thanks, God, take you or leave you, we leave you, I live my own life my way. God is holy, what's he going to do? Well, the punishment's death, yes. But God's so loving, he sent Jesus to die for the sins of the world. Yeah, he rose Jesus up and appointed him as ruler and judge, yes. And uh, No. <laughs> what? Anyway, a couple of weeks later, I'd become a follower of Jesus. And I went to him and I said, hey, I don't understand. Why is it that I was there saying, I'm ready to turn to Christ to submit my life to him and and you said no no take it and think about it and he said oh that's easy he goes one you don't want to have someone just make a rash decision on the spur of the moment especially with something so big as this when Jesus says you've got to count the cost because following Jesus at one level there's zero cost and everything cost the zero cost is Jesus has done absolutely everything to make me righteous in the sight of God and to save me the hundred cost is you give up your life, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. And he knew that would be a hard call. Jesus knows it's a hard call. And my uncle also said, look, God's sovereign. If you are going to be saved, you will get saved no matter what. And so my job is to obey Jesus and say, count the cost of discipleship. And so ever since my conversion, I've had a really helpful kind of um, uh, a real tangible, I guess, model of the teaching of Jesus, which is you to count the cost. Now, that is not purely for becoming a disciple. I've found in the 24, 25 years I've been a follower of Jesus, 
that periodically re-evaluating both the cost and the benefit of discipleship is A, a good thing to do, and B, something that inspires us toward being missional. Counting the costs, counting the benefit of being a follower of Jesus is something that inspires us to be missional. How does that work, Ben? What do you mean? Counting the costs, how does it work? Well, I'm going to tell you, that's where our Bible passage comes from today, where we've got a really excellent example of someone uh, counting the cost and also Jesus speaking about the benefit of entering into the kingdom and therefore being, I believe, inspired to become missional. I'll show you how it works. Uh, if you're a note taker or you want to sort of have a sense of where we are in the sermon, we're at point one. And in this little incident where Jesus meets the rich young ruler, Mark chapter 10, verse 17, uh, it's easy for us to, to sort of skirt over or to forget that this rich young ruler is probably, or is a very likely candidate, uh, for the, the most impressive person that the disciples of Jesus have ever met apart from Jesus. Why do I say that? Well, look at the first verse. His approach to Jesus is absolutely spot on as good as you can get. Verse 17, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him. Dignified men don't run unless there's something really, really important. He ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. And we remember this is a rich young ruler and he's happy to fall on his knees before Jesus. That's pretty good. And says to him, not even teacher, good teacher, not just rabbi, good rabbi. And then he asked the right question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, I know, Jesus, that you are the one who has the keys to eternal life. I know that's you. What must I do? You can't get a better approach in the Gospels to Jesus than this guy here. He's not like one of the Pharisees who kind of look down their nose. Oh, Jesus, you're letting your disciples pick heads of grain on the Sabbath. None of that, none of the judginess. This guy is... He sees Jesus as, as really good. As a matter of fact, so good, Jesus kind of can't help, perhaps, but, but engage on, on a really deep theological issue straight away. Why do you call me good, Jesus says. No one's good except God alone. Do you know something about me, possibly, that uh, the other people in Mark don't seem to know? I wish I knew the answer, but Jesus doesn't leave room for that. He just leaves that there hanging what his identity is. And he continues, verse 19, to the rich young ruler, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, shall not commit adultery, shall not steal, shall not give false testimony, shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. All but one of them come from the Ten Commandments, but they're not in order, and there's another one thrown in there. So I think Jesus is speaking generally at this point. You know the commandments of God, for which the Ten Commandments would be a sort of, you know, a pin-up example. And you almost get the sense that this guy interrupts him. Now, I don't know that for sure, but Jesus listing the commandments. Teacher, he says, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Now, brothers and sisters, if you're anything like me, you might at this point be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, <laughs> this guy's having himself on. Never told a little white lie, you know, come on. Never stolen something, you know, a little lolly from mum and dad or whatever. And never, uh, you know, being sort of dodgy to that friend you didn't like. You know, really? And it can be so easy and so tempting to think like that because, frankly, that's what I'm like. And uh, sorry to say it, but I'm pretty much expecting that's what you would be like. But, brothers and sisters, this is a really important lesson. We must not automatically read our thought and our experience into the word of God because that is not what Jesus nor the disciples nor the average first century Jew would have thought at this point remember how we had that first Bible reading from Deuteronomy where God had said if you obey my commands you'll be blessed fruits of the wombs open herds flocks multiply you won't be in lack blessed in the city blessed in the country it's all over Deuteronomy I just chose a small part we are right to expect that God is true and faithful. Who'd have thought God being true and faithful? And we are therefore right to expect, and the first century Jews did expect, that people, if they were a rich young ruler and they were in Israel, it is actually because they had obeyed the commands of God. 
This is not unique. It's rare, but not unique. Job, you might remember, the prophet Job was a righteous man. The apostle Paul, Philippians 3, was according to the law, blameless. They do exist. The Jews have a name for such a person. They call it a tzaddik, from the Hebrew word meaning a righteous one. This guy is a righteous one. He has kept the commands. To seal the deal, as a matter of fact, look at the next verse. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Because Jesus loves righteousness when he sees it. Now, you and I know Jesus loves everyone, right? But why does Mark think to include that particular saying right here? This is rare. Because this guy is righteous. He has kept the commands. And frankly, if anyone should be guaranteed entry into the kingdom of heaven, it must be this extremely impressive guy. If anyone should receive eternal life, which he's looking for, good teacher, what must I do to inherit? It should be this guy. His eventual rejection, which you've just heard and we're about to see again, results in a horrifying shock and a crisis of faith for the disciples of Jesus. They can't get their heads around that this guy doesn't get in. Speaking of that rejection, let's look at it together. We're at point two. Jesus continues and he says to the man, and I wonder if you've noticed this before, one thing you still lack. Jesus could never say that to me. He'd look at me and go, Ben, one million things you still lack, right? But with this guy, it's just one. One thing you still lack. Go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. The legal righteousness wasn't a problem for this guy. He doesn't say one command you haven't obeyed or followed. No, no, no. One thing you lack, sell what you've got. In other words, the blessings that are rightly yours, because under the old covenant, you've obeyed the law and you've, you've had the blessings, those blessings still pertain to this and only this world, right? The fruits of your womb, the herds and the flocks multiplying. Leave that behind. Show that you don't actually care about blessing in this life anywhere as much as you do in the age to come. Give it to the poor. You're used to giving things to the poor because you obey the law, yeah? Then come follow me. And it's, of course, at this point that verse 22, I love the expression, horrible as it is, at this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth, because there was so much stuff anchoring him to this world. Now, of course, brothers and sisters, don't mishear me, you and I know that there's no such thing as an ultimately righteous person other than Jesus. It is true that we're talking about legalistic righteousness as opposed to absolute righteousness. Of course, he's a sinner like everyone else. But you must remember that's sort of not the focus of the text. The focus of the text is that this righteous guy has had the maximum blessing available under the old covenant. But he needs to sit loose to the things of this world and know that Jesus has a kingdom that is not of this world. He needs to show that by getting rid of that and coming to follow him. And it's that point he can't do it. He's had so much success, so much blessing. He's a rich, young ruler. And that horrifies people. Like you wouldn't believe, verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich... And if you've got to remember in this context, they hear that as how hard it is for really righteous people, how hard it is for those righteous people, the tzaddiks, how hard it is for them to enter the kingdom of God. And so naturally, verse 24, the disciples were amazed. And the original Greek word he used can translate literally trembling and astounded. They were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again... He knows he's going to have to beat this one up. He said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, i.e. impossible, than for someone who is rich, read a really righteous, blessed person, to enter the kingdom of God. And so naturally, verse 26, the disciples were even more amazed, more astounded and trembling. And they said to each other, and you've got to feel the weight of this one, who then can be saved? 
if not even this righteous guy has a chance, well then we're stuffed, aren't we? <laughs> right? Who then can be saved? And you feel the force, because Mark includes the little detail of Jesus looking. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. Now, from one perspective, you're right to see this as rather hopeless. I remember doing a, a children's talk once upon a time on, on, on this uh, same passage of Scripture. And to get them to feel the weight of it, I, I gave the talk and, you know, is he going to get in? Is he going to get in? Uh, Jesus said it's impossible and I just shut the book and sat down. So, you know, it's impossible. We can't be saved. I just sat there for a minute. They had to feel the weight of it. And that, uh, that's really what, what Mark's doing, I think. Though God can thank God, literally, uh, as we see here, do the impossible. In order for anyone to, to be saved, we literally, according to Jesus, require God to do the impossible. That's, that's kind of what salvation is, is, is required. And uh, how do you know if God will do the impossible? Or how do you know if he has done the impossible? Well, that's where Mark takes us next. Point three in your outline. Uh, Peter, I'm guessing, with tremendous anguish, and as I like to say there, panic, because Peter's good at panic. He hits the panic button. Uh, and possibly even with a sense of defeat or hopelessness, summarises now the terrible predicament that the disciples find themselves in. Here he says, verse 28, we have left everything to follow you. You can hear the pain in it. Well, if this guy can't be saved, Jesus. We're stuffed and we've left everything to follow you. We're hopeless. What's going on? Like this is his crisis of faith. But of course, Jesus, you've got to remember, and this is one of the many reasons to love Jesus, is the ever-caring and compassionate Lord then gives the most comforting validation. And it's a validation I hope that you take to heart, brothers and sisters, and enjoy very deeply for yourselves this morning, uh, which is that that is precisely what it does mean to have God done the impossible. It's when you've left things to follow Jesus. That's actually what makes it uh, possible uh, under God. So... Verse 29, truly, I tell you, says Jesus, no one who has left homes or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, note the, the temporal blessing, yes, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, note, along with persecutions, because this age isn't what it's about, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But it's going to be unexpected. You're not going to get this. Many who are first will be last. Many last will be first. The wondrous blessing that being a follower of Jesus amounts to in the here and now is something that I'm literally standing here and looking at. Uh, I don't know if you appreciate this every Sunday, but I'm absolutely convinced, and I think God would agree, that what's happening right here is basically the most important meeting that happens in this suburb, this city, this town, on a weekly basis. People gather to hear the word of God and they gather as a family. When our uh, oldest child, Eli, was uh, born, uh, we had two months of having our fridge stocked with food because every day or every second day, people from our church family just came round and dropped off food. My dad saw it. He couldn't believe his eye. This is wonderful. Is this, is this a thing? <laughs> yeah. It's like this is church, you know. I've got so many brothers, sisters, uh, mums and dads. I have a lot of mums now. <laughs> More than one. Many. Because of the extraordinary blessing that being a part of God's church family is. And this is just in the here and now. And guys, it can be easy to underappreciate that. And I don't want you especially to lose sight of it uh, when God in his great kindness gives you a new ministry centre. That'll be a really helpful tool and a really wonderful thing. But it's still not the main game. The main game is people. as the kingdom of God, as the blessing, the brothers, sisters, the church family, the church community. And the fact that we're prepared now for what's going to be an eternity with one another surrounding God's throne. But those who think they can achieve perfect righteousness, like this rich young ruler has... And that that will be the means by which they receive blessing now and enter a kingdom of heaven. They're the ones that are having themselves on. 
It is those who frankly can't achieve perfect righteousness, which makes me feel better and probably makes you feel better. The ones who have left stuff to be followers of Jesus for whom God in his love and mercy has done the impossible. He has applied the death and resurrection of Jesus to you. He has taken the righteousness that Jesus has, which is more righteous than this rich young ruler, and has credited it to your account if you have followed him, if you take up your cross and follow him, which if you're a follower of Jesus, that's what you've done. However, it may be the case, because I know very few people here, that maybe that's something you've not done. You might be someone sitting here who is not as yet a follower of Jesus. You might be someone who has said, yeah, I'm kind of okay with Jesus, but I really, really love holding on to my life, the things of this world. I can't, uh, uh, whether it's literally or metaphorically, sit loosely or give up the things of this life in order to follow Jesus. If that's you, then you need to hear the benefit of being a follower of Jesus. It's called eternal life and it's called the kingdom of heaven and it's also called the family of God. Uh, Just give up, will you? You probably know in your heart of hearts that Jesus really is who he says he is. And that it's no good for you to gain even the whole world if it means you forfeit your soul. Eternity is a long time. Even the most righteous person that the disciples had ever met, apart from Jesus, couldn't let go of the trappings of this world. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. But it's not impossible. Give it up. If you're here and you're not let a follower of Jesus, please, I beg you, give it up. Give up your commitment to this perishing world. Save yourself from this crooked and corrupt generation. Turn to Jesus like I did and say, you know what, I'm not going to be the boss of my life anymore. I'm going to live under the lordship of Jesus. Frankly, he's a better steerer of the ship than what I am anyway. You've got the perfect place to do it. It's a wonderful community here that loves and knows the word of God. You know, go and hit up Campbell and say, Oi, I want to be a follower of Jesus. I'm sorry I've been shy and too chicken to say anything about it, but help me out, brother. And he will. But for those who do know the Lord, which I'm going to guess is the vast majority, if not all of us here, then the wonderful thing about being confronted with the cost and the benefit of, of following Jesus, which we've seen in this passage, is just remind you again of the reality that's already yours you have given everything up. I know you don't feel like it sometimes and you can easily feel guilty. Oh, no, I'm sticking to it. You have. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, guess what? You've t- denied yourself, taken up your cross and followed him. Sometimes our brain just takes a while to catch up with the reality. Followers of Jesus are freed up, therefore, to be missional. We've already given up everything to follow him. Now, let me tell you how this can work out by way of implication in practice. In a small way, in a big way. I have only ever been here once before, and that was a couple of years back. But I'm going to make a little guess that for many people, possibly most people, I don't know, but for many people who are sitting here right now, that if you were here last week, you were sitting in roughly the same place where you currently are sitting now. And the week before that, you are probably sitting in roughly the same place where you're sitting now. There's some degrees of variation, but typically we are creatures of habit. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? God's a God who likes order, you know, Genesis 1. It's cool. But sometimes it can be really helpful to just put your brain where your spiritual reality already is by challenging yourself and saying, you know what I'm going to do next Sunday? I'm going to force myself to sit somewhere different. That is so tiny. And so easy. But it can be just a little reminder, you know what? My comfort, oh, I gave that up long ago because I'm a follower of Jesus. I don't need that comfort. I, my, uh, the, the fact that the heater is warmer here, I, yeah, okay, very good. But I gave that up because I'm a follower of Jesus. Oh, I've got eternity and I've got brothers and sisters. I don't need that. See, it's just a tiny little thing just to impress upon yourself the spiritual reality that you're freed up to be missional because you're already a follower of Jesus. That's a small one. Here's a bigger one. I've got no idea of the external ministries that take place within your church community. I suspect they're good and wonderful. I see that you guys are having a who's coming to lunch thing. Uh, uh, youth and kids stuff going on out there. I wouldn't be surprised. You're at a school. Maybe you guys do scripture. I don't know. You can tell me afterwards at morning tea. But I'll use the example of scripture because we're in a school building. Imagine 
that you, you know, you, your nine to five job that five or six days a week you're working, you said, I don't need all that time at work because I can live with four or five days and I can be freed up one of those days to go teach kids scripture. I'm going to lose a bit of my money. I'm going to lose a bit of my kudos. Some people at the office are going to say, what's wrong with you, you moron? Doesn't matter. I've given that up already. You, you don't have to think, oh, will I make this sacrifice? You've already made it. <laughs> You've already taken up your cross to follow him. You just need to slowly catch up with the spirituality. It's so liberating and freeing once you get it. I heard a wonderful story once of a fellow who's a World War II uh, veteran, now, 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 now with the Lord, uh, who in one particular battle did something rather heroic, which was to, to sort of jump a, a, you know, a barracks or a trench or whatever it is, go 50 metres in order to, to deliver some, some ammunition to a bunch of other people. But he did it in a, in, in a context where there was a lot of fire and artillery shelling. And someone said to him, how did you have the bravery to, to put yourself in that situation and do that? And his response was, well, once I'd accepted that I was pretty much dead already, it wasn't that hard. <laughs> and I kind of get that. Once you've accepted that you've already taken up your cross to follow Jesus, you've actually got nothing to lose anyway and so it enabled it just freed him up to do what was required to be done brothers and sisters i'm going to conclude in prayer and i'm going to pray that uh, you and i uh, will periodically keep counting the cost and the benefit of following jesus and be reminded that the spiritual reality which is the, the truth means we are in fact freed up to be more missional because we are those who have given up everything let me conclude in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has made the impossible possible by dying for our sin, rising for our justification, bestowing upon us his righteousness. Father, we thank you that as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have denied ourselves, taken up our cross, and are following him. We recognise that sometimes our heads, hearts, and hands don't catch up with that spiritual reality. But Father, we rejoice in the freedom we have to give up things, to think about being missional. We, we pray that we would make the most of that freedom, whether it be in small ways, like sitting in a different seat, or big ways, like uh, altering our life choices and priorities and decisions to see gospel ministry go forward. We pray you bless us in these endeavours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.